This morning I want to speak to you on the topic of getting on the right path. Getting on the right path. If you have your Bibles, I want to look at one little verse of Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, chapter 6 and verse 16. While you're turning there, Pastor Eric mentioned the uh, church app. You know, there's all kinds of free stuff on there. Uh, there's 30 translations of the scripture. There's daily Bible readings. And if you like, you can uh, plug it into your Bluetooth on your car and it'll read the Bible to you while you're on the way to work. So, uh, and it don't cost you anything. You can't beat that with a stick. I'm here to tell you. So uh, download the church app and enjoy the benefits. Getting on the right path. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you'll find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Now, if you've been with us for the last few weeks, uh, I've been talking about a topic called Solemn Assembly. And uh, a solemn assembly is basically a designated time for God's people to diligently seek the Lord. It's uh, maybe a set time or a season of prayer and fasting where we draw near to God and seek God's face for refreshment and spiritual renewal. Now, we have not set a date, but we are going through a series of sermons hoping to lay the foundation to, uh, to, to, to wet your whistle, if you will, a little bit, leading up to the time when we sense God calling us to have the solemn assembly. And the reason I sense in my spirit that we need to have a time of refreshing and renewal and a calling us back to a right relationship with God. It's not because I think our church is dead. It's not because I'm thinking about some great moral, uh, uh, terrible thing that's going on in the congregation. It's more like a gradual slip. You know, I used to have a cocker spaniel. Uh, and I uh, had that thing for about 12 or 14 years. And that cocker spaniel and I... We had kind of an unusual relationship. I let her alone, she let me alone. And uh, uh, we just kind of coexisted. But it was my job to give the dog a bath. I hated giving the dog a bath because put her, I had, I had all the tools and everything, a hose and everything. Put that dog in the bathtub, wet it down, and soap it up, you know, and had hair like you wouldn't believe. But nonetheless, I, and the whole time I'm washing the dog, I, 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 I could just, the dog was always just leaning away from me, just leaning away from me, and just leaning away from me, until finally I'd have to grab her and pull her back over here, and I'd start, she'd just lean away from me, and lean away. It was so subtle that I didn't even notice it while it was going on, until she was out of reach, and I'd slide her back across. You know, that's the way we are spiritually sometimes. What we do is, is we get engaged in our life, we get engaged with our family, we get engaged in our career and our jobs and so forth and so on. We gradually start leaning away from the Lord. And so a time of solemn assembly and spiritual renewal is a time for God to speak to us and bring us back to a right relationship with Him. And so this morning I want to talk to you on the subject of getting on the right path. You know, every path leads somewhere. Every path starts somewhere and it leads somewhere. In my mind, as I think about this, I can picture going out the back door of my house when I was a boy, the childhood home I grew up in, and just as you got out of the backyard, there was a fork. There was a fork in the path. One way, if you took it, it always led to the hog barn. The other way led to my great granny's house. Now, my great grandmother, we, we had a name for her, her name was Dadall. I don't know where it came from, but that's what we called her. And so I would stand there and have to decide whether I wanted to go to the hog barn where there was hogs and everything that accompanies hogs, or if I wanted to go down to Dadall's and let her tell me stories about when she was a little girl, and then after she would tell us a story, she would give us a muffin. Now, these muffins 
have never been duplicated anywhere on the planet Earth. And my mouth just drools thinking about them. And I would go and listen to her stories just hoping she'd say, do you want a muffin? And so one path would lead to the hog barn and the other path would lead to Dadal's. And if I wanted to get muddy and I wanted to stink and I wanted to associate with pigs, I'd take one path. If I wanted some muffins, I'd take the other path. This passage that I'm showing you this morning is Jeremiah presenting God's people standing at the fork of the road. And he says, you've got to choose one path or the other. One path is going to lead you one place. The other path is going to lead you in a good place. Now, which way are you going to go? He's calling them to make a decision. And this morning, I want you to understand that we must make certain that we are on the right path. That's the central focus of what I'm talking about, is making sure we're on the right path. Now, in Jeremiah's day, the people of God, the children of Israel, had taken the wrong path. They had turned away from the Lord God, and they had begun to worship idols. They had fallen deeply into idolatry and everything associated with that pagan idolatry. They had become materialistic. They had become immoral. They had become politically corrupt. If you read the preceding verses, it says that uh, they had, up in verse 13, it said, from the least of them even to the greatest of them, they're greedy for gain. And from the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They had gotten greedy. They had gotten materialistic. And even the preachers were involved in lying and cheating and carrying on and they would tell the people peace peace but there was no peace and verse 15 says something that I believe is uh, indicative of our society it says were they ashamed because of their abominations that they have done they were not ashamed at all they didn't even know how to blush don't even know how to blush they, there is no shame in them now, we have a society that doesn't want to blush. If you don't believe it, go to Walmart. <laughs> I was over there the other day, and there was a man walking around in a terry cloth house coat. Somebody needs to teach that man to blush. And so that's the place that they found themselves. They had turned away from the right path. And in His mercy, God offers His people an opportunity to get back on the right path, the path of righteousness. And so as we preach these messages, I think it's time that we as the body of Christ stop leaning away from the Lord and start leaning into God. You may remember we talked about that valley of dry bones and how God wants to breathe fresh breath upon us. And last week we talked about the presence of God and we pray that He would cause His face to shine upon us. This morning I want to talk to you about getting on the right path. And I want to show you three things in this small little verse. Number one, I want you to see that God speaks to us. Number two, as God speaks to us, He commands us to evaluate our ways. And number three, God gives us an opportunity to change. God speaks to us, the first thing I want you to see, God speaks to us about our ways. Do you notice that? Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Now, this is God speaking. Do you understand that? This is God speaking to the people. This is not Jeremiah. God is speaking through Jeremiah to these people. He speaks to people that had turned away from him and had gotten on the wrong path and so he's giving them another opportunity because God intends to bring terrible judgments upon the people of God if they don't repent and when God speaks to us don't you think we ought to listen that's when you say amen all right now men we need to listen to God not like we listen to our wives now, a lot of you men out there, you listen, you hear, but you don't hear. Women, that's when you say amen. Uh, because you, you'll hear the noise and you'll hear the sound and you'll say, uh-huh, and you'll grunt, but it never registers. 
Can I get a witness? Y'all know what I'm talking about. You see, God speaks to us today, and this is not just background noise. How does God speak to people today? God speaks through His Word. God speaks through His Word, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus told the apostles that the Holy Spirit will guide you. It is the Spirit of God that leads us in accordance with His inspired Word. As God's Word is preached, God's Spirit applies God's Word to our hearts. Now, God speaks to us for several ways. First off, God speaks to us in His Word, sometimes to bring comfort. That's why we share the Word of God when somebody has a death at a funeral. It's to bring forth comfort from God's Word. Sometimes God speaks through His Word to share the benefits or the blessings that He's promised to us. Sometimes God speaks through His Word and uh, and energizes it by His Spirit to correct His people. To correct His people. And that's what this message is about. It's about uh, stand in the ways and consider your ways. But I want you to understand this. Sometimes God is through speaking. Sometimes God's finished speaking. Proverbs 29 verse 1 says, A man who hardens his neck, that means becomes a stiff neck or becomes stubborn, a man who hardens his neck after much reproof, listen to this, will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. The children of Israel had worshipped idols and finally God had gotten enough of it and He sent the Babylonians to overtake and burn the city of Jerusalem. And this is what the prophet Jeremiah said just prior to the final judgment. He said in 2 Chronicles uh, 36 verse 16, they continually mocked the messengers of God. They heard preaching, but they said, oh, big deal. They mocked the messengers of God, despised His words and scoffed at His prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against His people, until there was no remedy. Now you see, God speaks to us about our ways. But there's going to come a time when God stops speaking. Now this message by Jeremiah, actually, if you study the history, it's Jeremiah's final message to them about returning to God. In this message, God gives them a choice. But the problem was, they thought it was just preaching. It's just like the rest of the sermons we hear. They walked out of the church and they said, yeah, well, maybe, all right. They thought the Word of God was up for negotiation. They said to themselves, well, God's going to judge us. Well, maybe one of these days. Did you ever stop to think about this? Did you ever stop to think that hell is crowded with people who were raised in Baptist churches? Oh, yeah. You say, well, why is that? They had praying parents. They had pizza in their youth group they sit in church meetings and they always intended one of these days to give their heart to Jesus every single one of them every single one of them heard a final word from God they all heard a final word from God now they didn't know it was that final word they didn't know it but it was God's final message God was through speaking to them But they didn't know it was their final call. Let me ask you this. How do you know that today is not your final call? How do you know that this is the last time you're ever going to be able to hear Jesus say, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Can you guarantee me today that you're going to hear multiple messages and you can just pick a time in the future when you are going to decide you're going to get saved? Oh, I don't think so. You see, the people of Jerusalem, this message was more than a choice. It was an ultimatum. This was the last time God was going to speak to them. They stood at the fork of the road, and they can either return to the Lord or they can go another way. The question is for us this morning, is there anybody in the sound of my voice that God has been speaking to you? 
Jesus is calling. He's tenderly calling. He's lovingly, persistently calling. And you've been turning a deaf ear. Let me ask you something. Are you a Christian and you've strayed off the right path? And God's been calling you, God's been wooing you, God's been convicting you, God's been speaking to you, but you keep walking down the wrong path. Let me ask you a question. How much, how many times, how much is God obligated to keep calling you? I'm here to tell you, God is not obligated at all. When God talks to us about revival and spiritual awakening, How much is he going to need to call us? Can we just yawn and walk out the back door and say, oh well, that sounds good. Maybe one of these days I'm going to get back on the right path, but today I'm too busy. Let me ask you this. How often and how long is God obligated to continue to show mercy and grace to a nation such as ours who disregards his commandments, refuses to allow children to pray in school, normalizes gross immorality, and celebrates cold-hearted slaying of pre-born babies in the wombs of their mothers. How long is God going to keep giving grace and mercy to a nation such as that? The answer is God is not obligated God is not obligated. The fact that God calls us to return when we stray is is an indication of pure love and mercy and grace. And the fact that God repeatedly stands at the door and knocks at the the churches of America is a sure sign of the long-suffering and patient endurance of the mercy of all. God, but I'm here to tell you, unless we get ourselves on the right path, there's going to come a time when God says that's the last word. I remember when I was a boy, we used to like riding the back of the trucks. Anybody riding the back of trucks anymore? You'd probably get a ticket, go to jail and everything else. Back then, uh, we, had, we had lounge chairs in the back of our truck, you know, as a so what you did, didn't have air conditioner in the summertime, you know, it was better in the back than it was in the front. And uh, I remember uh, uh, we had, we had t- taken some livestock to the sale barn, and me and my brother were in the back, and y'all know what cattle racks are. They're these racks you put on your truck so the cows can't jump out, and we had hauled some cattle to the market. And so me and my brother, we were in the back, and my daddy was driving. We had been, in a, been on the road for a good while, and me and him, we got bored. What we did when we got bored is we were like Baptists. We, we got bored, we started a fight. And so uh, that's, that's what we were doing. And uh, we were back there throwing uh, whatever the cows had put in the, in the floor of the truck. We were throwing that at each other. And, uh, uh, you know, it's down, it, stopping at red lights and stuff. And this is going on. And my daddy, he said, you boys better stop that. We'd stop for a few minutes. He'd take off a red light. We'd start back up. I'm not telling you again, you better stop it. We'd stop for a few minutes. We'd get on down the road a little ways. We'd start it right back up. He said about four times, you boys better stop. Now see, the whole time he's speaking to us, that's grace and mercy. Then he stopped talking to us. And we thought, we mistakenly thought, that his not saying anything was his silent approval of that which what we were doing. And so for the last eight miles home, we didn't hear a word out of daddy. We're throwing stuff and carrying on in the back of that truck. And then we pulled up that long gravel driveway and he cut off the motor. And we're just happy to get out, you know, and everything's good. And on the way out from the driver's seat to the tailgate, he's undoing his belt. (laughs) Now, my daddy was not one of these sophisticated young parents. He believed in whoopings. (laughs) Now, his whoopings may have warped me, but I'd rather be warped by his whoopings than warped by some of this stuff going on today. And I'm here to tell you something. He said the final thing way back then. And while he was speaking to us, that was grace and mercy. But when he stopped speaking, 
it was too late. God speaks to us about our ways. The second thing I want you to see is God calls us to evaluate our ways. God spoke to the people in Jerusalem through the prophet Jeremiah. He told them to look, evaluate, examine the path that you're on. They were on a path that was leading them to destruction. They, they needed to stop and evaluate and look at where they were going and change roads, get on the right path. Notice what he says. He says, stand by the ways and see. In other words, take stock, evaluate. Where are you at? What is the current path you're on? The idea here is, is to stop and see where you're headed. Now think for a moment. If as a child, I left my back door. If when I was a boy, I stepped out the back door of my, my country house, and I walked down to that fork in the road, and I stood there, and I said, which path do I want to take? And I decided to go to the hog pen. What reason would I have when I stood amongst the hogs to expect muffins? <laughs> Beloved, God's people today are out here sowing wild oats and then praying for crop failure. We reap what we sow. You, 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 you're going to go somewhere down the wrong path and it's going to lead you to the wrong place. So many people are going to wake up one of these days and say, how in the world did I get here? Look back where you took the wrong path. This is so simple. People sow, like I said, Haggai chapter 1 verse 5 says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, consider your ways. The prophet says, the problem is your ways. Consider your ways. Take stock, stand. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it is the way of death. Jesus said that there are two paths of life. Matthew 7, 13, Jesus says, enter in through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few there be that find it. So as you evaluate your ways this morning, the major question I'd like to ask is, are you saved? Has there been a time in your life where you've repented of your sins, turned your life to Christ because He is the only hope of salvation? Have you experienced the new birth? And if you haven't this morning, Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. And so this morning, in just a few moments, we're going to give a gospel invitation. And I'm going to invite you to do something that you thought you would never do. I'm going to invite you to take a step of faith and to step out and to walk down here and pray with somebody to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And you can be born again right here today. We should evaluate our ways right now. Beloved brother, beloved sister, Christian church member, how are your ways this morning? He said, stand by the ways and see. We should ask. Because you see, Christians sometimes stray from the right path. My daddy had a, a milk cow. He named her Bessie. She was a pet more than anything else. My daddy loved that old cow. And Bessie was so mild-mannered, you could set babies on her back, and she didn't care. You could do anything with her, lead her around. But she had this problem of getting away. Now, Bessie never jumped a fence. She was too fat. She couldn't jump. And she never broke through the fence intentionally. But you know how that, that old cow kept getting away? Something about her nature, she liked to run her neck through the fence, and that little bit of grass over there looked better than this whole field full of grass. And so she'd reach her neck out there and she'd lean against the fence, just, just trying to get that next little tuft of grass. And she'd get that, and the harder she leaned, eventually the fence would just fall over. And then she'd just nibble her way until she was lost. We'd have to go find her. 
You know what? God's people, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Many of God's people have nibbled themselves onto the wrong path. You never intended to. You never set out in a rebellious way to say, God, I'm through with you. I'm going to walk the devil's highway. You never did that. You just got preoccupied with other things. You began to take a bite here and a bite there and a bite here and a bite there. And now where are you? Where are you? I once, I once ministered to a man and he called me to come see him. And while we were there, he received Christ as his Savior. This guy had been a prisoner. He had been uh, locked up and it was ex-convict and he, he, he got gloriously saved. It was just great to watch. And he walked with the Lord for quite a while. He didn't have a job, didn't have a, any prospects, nobody would hire him. So he got himself a, a grill and he started cooking meat in his front yard. Now, if you want to get a crowd in a small town, start cooking meat in your yard. And that's what he did. And people were starting to stop. He started selling barbecue right out of the front yard. People came from everywhere to buy this guy's barbecue. Next thing you know, he just got a big old barrel or two out there and a big smoker. I mean, it was you could smell it for another county over. I mean, people were coming in there. And, and he said, you know, I think I'm going to build me a restaurant. He built him a restaurant, and, and it was packed the very first night. He was selling barbecue. He was getting successful. He was hiring waitresses. He was, I mean, this guy, it just took off. One day we were talking, and he said, Pastor, he said, how can I honor God with, with, with my success? I said, do this. I said, tithe off your income and keep that restaurant closed on Sunday. I said, I know there's a lot of church folks that want to come and eat in your restaurant on Sunday, but God will bless you if you just keep it closed on Sunday and stay in the house of God, stay in church. All right, so he did. Everything was great. He was doing better and better and better. And then the Lord called me to another ministry, and I, I left that church, and the church went without a pastor for a while. This old boy got discouraged. Next thing you know, he stopped reading the Word. Next thing you know, he was too busy to be involved in fellowship group. Then he was too busy to go to church. And he fell out of church on Sunday. And then you know what he did? He decided, since I ain't going to church, I might as well open the restaurant. So he opened up his restaurant on Sunday. The church people flooded in. Six months later, it burned to the ground. He lost everything he had. You're saying, preacher, are you telling me that the Lord burned his restaurant down? Probably. <laughs> you see, because here's the thing. We serve a jealous God. We serve a jealous God. And he said, you should have no idols before me. We serve a jealous God. What had happened was this old boy had gradually nibbled himself away from the ways of the Lord. He had gotten on the wrong path. I want to ask you this morning, is anybody in here nibbling? Are you nibbling? Stop nibbling and get on the right path, man. Don't allow your business and career and recreation and hobbies to become an idol, God might have to take it away from you. And then finally, I want you to see, God speaks to us about our ways. God calls us to evaluate our ways. Then I want to tell you the good news is God allows us to change our ways. Notice what he says here. He says, ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you'll find rest for your souls. Now, that implies a choice. The ancient paths, we could say, are the paths that Abraham walked by faith. The ancient paths are the paths trodden by Moses in the Ten Commandments in the way of righteousness. The ancient paths are the, are the paths of prayer and, and fellowship with God's people. The ancient paths are to love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. The ancient path is to be filled with the Spirit of God and to walk in peace and love and joy. The ancient path is walking right with God. 
And if and when we have strayed from the right path, praise be to God, he gives us the opportunity to get back on the right path. But I'm here to tell you this morning, God will not force us to walk the right path. It's our decision. It's our choice. One time I took this girl to Atlanta uh, with her husband. And uh, she needed to go to a hospital and they didn't have a way to get there, so her husband and, and I took her down there, and uh, we dropped her off. I'll never forget this because I felt so stupid after it was over. Uh, we dropped her off. I don't know if you've ever been to Atlanta or not, but we got all bum-puzzled and turned around on the interstates down there. And so uh, uh, we let her off, and, and we drove for two hours. And I'll never forget looking at him, and I said, you know, we ought to be close to Birmingham. He said, yeah, it's about time. And there was one of them green signs right there. It said, next exit, Augusta. <laughs> now, if you know your geography, you'll know that I done drove two hours the exact wrong direction. Georgia's nice, but that ain't where I was going. <laughs> so now, what are my options? You think I could just keep going until I traverse the earth? I, I, that's not an option. Listen, when you find yourself going the wrong direction, the only thing you can do is turn around. That's all you can do is turn around. That word turn around, that's the Bible word for repent. It means get on the right path. Get on the right path. Why would anybody keep going in the wrong direction? Why would anybody be so stubborn as to know they're headed in the wrong direction and the signs say, next stop, Augustus, and you say, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I'm going to get home. You say, preacher, you're stupid. That is stupid. And yet how many people in life look around, everything's falling apart, everything's going bad, things are rough, everything's tough, uh, the way of the backslider is hard, the Bible says, and yet they're in denial and they say, it's not, it's not, I want to keep going, I'm going to keep going. All you can do is turn around. The second thing I want you to see is, not only is it a choice, when God gives us the grace to turn around or get on the right path, it's a choice, but the right path is the way of blessing. Do you see what he said in the text? You'll find rest. He said it's the good way. Walk in the good way where the good way is and walk in it and you'll find rest for your souls. The Bible says in Psalm 16, 11, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Psalms 23, verse 3, one of your favorite Psalms, the 23rd Psalm says, He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Psalm 25, 10 says, All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. Psalm 119, 11, I'm sorry, 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Proverbs 4, 18 says, but the path of righteousness is like a light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until a full day. You see, on the path of the Lord, there's joy, there's light, there's guidance, and all who get on the right path are led to the presence of the Lord. And then there's the blessing of rest. He says, you'll find rest for your souls. Wow, that's such a blessing. Did you ever stop to think about how exhausting sinful living is? I mean, sinful living. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I've lived both ways. And I know sinful living is, is, is exhausting. Yeah, liars, people who lie all the time, they have to always keep track of the last lie they told. You know, mentally, it's just horrible. Uh, uh, I see the poor addicted to chemicals and alcohol, and they wear themselves out chasing their drug of choice. Sin is exhausting. Sin will ruin you financially. Sin will destroy your most precious relationships, and sin will kill you physically. I once worked in a place... It was a mechanic shop. Most of the mechanics in there were bad drunks. 
They'd come to work with little to no sleep. Red eyes, half out of their minds. They dragged around exhausted all day. They'd sleep through lunch. And as soon as they got off work, they'd go and do it again. After a few years, those men were hardly recognizable. Physically, sin was was driving them to the brink of physical, mental, and spiritual exhaustion and ultimately spiritual destruction. Sin is a pathway to a sad, painful, early grave and sin will send your soul to hell. Sin leads Christians out of the path of righteousness and puts them on the road of destruction. And old backslidden brother, old backslidden sister, your sin will exalt you, exhaust you and when it, gets, when it gets done with you, it will destroy your testimony. I had a man tell me one time, he said, uh, well, preacher, you know, it don't matter how I live as long as I go to heaven. It don't matter how I live as so long as I go to heaven. I know I'm saved. What difference does it make? And this man lived a backslidden life for many years. And then he finally came to his senses one day. And he got on the right path. He got back in the house of God And when he did, when he finally became spiritually awoke, he became burdened for his children. And then one day he said, you know, preacher, I tried to share Christ with my daughter. And after I got through, you know what she said? She said, Daddy, surely you don't expect me to become the hypocrite that you are. He said, you know, preacher, I'm just reaping what I sowed. Isn't it great to know that today God is giving us the opportunity and the grace and out of His sheer love from Calvary's cross, He is calling to each and every one of us, choose the right path. Today is the day. Make your choice. Today the opportunity is here. Get on the right path. Do you notice what they said? Jeremiah preached this sermon. They said, we'll not walk in it. They made a terrible choice. If you know the history, Jerusalem was burned just a few years later. and It was a terrible, terrible thing. God offers us opportunities to get on the right path. We have the choice to choose the ancient path where the good way is and the Lord will give you rest. And so the ball is now in your court. The choice is up to you. Which way will you turn? I'm not a big history buff, but I do like to study things about the Civil War and World War II for some reason. The Battle of the Bulge was the last offensive of the Germans, the last big offensive the Germans were able to uh, manage. They almost won the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, one of the things the enemy did before the Allies met them at the Battle of the Bulge, the enemy went down all the streets in Belgium and around where this this Battle of the City, and they, they turned all the street signs the opposite directions. (laughs) <laughs> that way when the allies came in and they were dependent upon the street signs it was sending them in the opposite direction they were so confused and the Germans nearly won the war until somebody figured out you know what you can't trust those faulty signs we got to get on the right path and of course the allies won the victory beloved I want to tell you something the enemy has changed road signs so many people have listened to the media and the internet and false teachers and all kinds of ridiculous nonsense that's going on today the right path is found in thus saith the Lord it's in the word of God and the grace of God today is available to anyone anyone who may be on the wrong path and we can change our ways we can get on the right path 
question is this morning, which path will you take? Would you stand with me, bow your head and close your eyes? Will you, will you solemnly and sincerely give serious thought to the Word of God this morning? If God says to you this morning, I want you to get on the right path, would you answer Him like they did? We'll not walk in it. Would you miss out on the good way and the rest for your souls? There are some here this morning who need to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God's called you to be here in this service this morning because God in His grace and by His Spirit is calling you to come to the cross by faith, come to the cross where Jesus died. And, 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 and tell the Lord, pray to the Lord, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sins. And today I want to trust you and ask you to be my Savior and Lord. If you just pray a simple prayer like that, the Word of God says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved and then some of you this morning need to stop nibbling you need to stop nibbling you need to lift up your head and see where you are and as a Christian you need to get back on the right path and then maybe you're here today you're a, you're a deacon you're a Sunday school teacher you're a trustee you're a church leader will you join together with me as we pray that God would exalt himself in our midst and, and, and do something phenomenal in this church. That he would help us to lean in on him. Would, would, would you help me with that this morning? I'm going to pray. Whatever God says, if, if you need to join this church or what, whatever decision the Lord lays on your heart, I trust you're going to do it. Now, Father, You've offered us a gracious choice. Help us, O oh Lord, by the power of your Spirit to walk in the ancient path. Lord, if there's anyone who needs to confess Jesus as their Savior, behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time, saith the Lord. I pray today, God, you give grace for salvation. If there's anyone here today that needs to change the path you're on, would you do it now? In Jesus' name I pray, amen.